Welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Here is Munir Lazuzi from easymedicaldevice.com. And today we'll try to help you to prepare your audits. I mean, there are many types of audits, so we'll discuss about that. And for that, I have with me Karandeep Badwal, who will help us to really understand more and more about audits. So Karandeep, welcome to the Medical Device Made Easy podcast. Thank you, Miam, again, Munir. How are you today? I'm good, I'm good. I mean, it's uh, Easter. We are in the Easter period so yeah I, I played with the kid yesterday we we, we hide you know, all those chocolates and we are going on the on the on the garden to to pick them so it was really great so yeah I mean it, it's a good time for think and we are we're also in the transition between um winter and summer which uh, and uh, and spring which is really great because yeah we start to see also outside that everything starts to live again which is uh, really great and how about you is it great there in the UK uh, we had about a day of sun and then we got back to the rain again. I mean, okay. yeah, as <laughs> it's typical UK. <laughs> exactly. Great. Uh, Karadip, as we said, so uh, we'll talk about um, audits, how people should be prepared for audits. But before that, can you just make a small introduction of yourself, even if I know that a lot of people know you? Yes, yeah, so I'm Karen Deep and I'm a quality and regulatory consultant working within the medical devices space. And just like many else, I'm also a content creator where I teach people about quality and regulatory and I'm also the host of the MedTech podcast, where I interview different people in different types of medical technologies. Yeah, and uh, really, I, I advise you to to go and, and listen to that, uh, because mainly you have really the experience of others that are providing information of uh, what they are doing in different fields. So it's not just uh, one specific field, which is uh, really great. I mean, I like also uh, when I do some podcast episodes where I have people that are coming and sharing also their journey, their experience etc is also something great so i really i really like also the those those kind of concepts so so yeah don't hesitate to go to look at that i, I will try to put everything on the show notes so don't hesitate also to go on the show notes and i will pl place all the contact details for karen deep so if you want to see uh, to see uh, what he's doing um karen deep as we said we'll talk about audits um can we have first an explanation of what is an audit Maybe also because I have some questions that some people that were asking me, um, what is the difference between audit and inspection, all those kind of things. So is there a way to sort that out? So yeah, effectively, I think the first thing that we need to talk about in terms of medical devices are what are the different types of audits that happen? And it's important to understand that they are different types. So the first one, of course, is an internal audit, which is an audit that you do within the company. Now, either this is somebody that's been appointed in the company to do the audit, or you can bring in an external court, um, consultant to do that for you. But it's something that happens internally. Then, of course, we have the different types of external audits. Uh, we have the official audit from a certification body, i.e. you're going for ISO 13485, CE marking, UKCA, et cetera. Yeah. And then, of course, we also have the unannounced audit from a notified body, which is they, <laughs> from the name itself. They come and do an audit on you once you are certified without telling you that this is going to happen. And then, of course, uh, we have what's known as uh, supplier audits, which is effectively you have a supplier that you use within the company and you basically go out and you conduct an audit on them. So let's say you're a physical device manufacturer. And one of your key components, of, um, key component suppliers, you go out and do a supplier audit on them to make sure everything is in order. In addition to that, we also have what's known as inspections. Now, inspections are slightly different. These are not conducted by notified bodies or certification bodies, but these are conducted by health authorities. So this may be that they may have a concern about a particular type of device that you're making, or maybe you're a new company and they want to inspect you to make sure everything is in order. Those really are the key different types of audits that there are and the difference between an audit and a inspection. Yeah, I'm always saying to, to some people that uh, when you have an audit, you asked for it. But when you have an inspection or audit, it's like, yeah, you are just <laughs> waiting for it, if I can say. But uh, it's worse. For me, it's worse to get an inspection than to get an audit because kind of an inspection is more like, um, I mean, I heard this sentence sometimes that people are saying to me that when it's an inspection, it's like you are guilty until you prove that you are not. And when it's an audit, so it's like you are not guilty until they find something that against against you. So many this is the two things that are happening then. And uh, and yeah, if, usually when there is an inspection, it's like maybe sometimes something bad happened or or whatever. But uh, yeah, this is uh, many the problem. And um, have you had already the experience within some inspections? Like I had the experience of FDA inspection or this kind of thing. So did you have already those kind of things? Unannounced audit, yes. Um, inspections, no. So either my clients are really good at hiding what they do, or they're very, very good at their job that they never get inspected. 
<laughs> Great, yeah. Yeah, okay. I, uh, an unannounced audit is also a tricky one because, um, yeah, you you come one day and uh, somebody knocks at the door and says, oh, I come to audit you and say, oh, who, who is this guy? Where, where they are coming, etc." So you are all surprised. So it's many uh, really unannounced, which is um, not a great experience. But when you, if you are ready, you are ready. So you can be ready, uh, audit ready every day. So, um, so here we talk about the different types of audits. Um, we should talk also about the person that is executing this audit. So mainly, um, is there a specific qualification or can everybody be an auditor? Or what's exactly the, the rules there? It's a very strange one because the word used is competent. Now, what yeah. does competent mean? Is it somebody who's got one year's experience? Is somebody who's got 10 years experience? Is it somebody who's got a certification with no experience? And it's a very strange one. And many, I know you've been in this position before yeah. whereby... You could have years and years of experience as an auditor, but until you've got a piece of paper that says you're a certified auditor, some notified bodies don't like that. Now, my counter argument is this. Now, if you had to have a surgery tomorrow, would you prefer someone who's been to university and just holds a certificate but has never done a surgery? Or would you prefer someone who's done hundreds of surgeries but doesn't have a certificate? I know which one I'll pick. So it's a very strange one, really. It's A lot of auditors are now asking, um, external auditors this is, that you have some sort of certification in process for ISO 13485 or whichever standard that you're going to be auditing to. But reality is when it comes to auditing, you learn it through experience. You know, you learn the techniques, how to ask people the types of questions, the kind of hurdles that you're going to have, writing reports, et cetera. It comes through experience. So I wouldn't state a typical figure, but I would generally say that if you've got at least two years experience within quality and regulatory affairs, you should be able to go out and audit. Or at the very least, uh, you should be able to be an auditor, maybe work under a lead auditor, maybe it's got more experience. So my view Two years is around the right amount. Some people may argue less, some people may argue more, but that's generally what I recommend. Yeah, and um, and you are right. I, I had a lot of issues myself uh, with the, some uh, notified bodies uh, because I, I have 15 years of experience. I've done since the beginning of my career only quality and regulatory affairs. I was management representative for all my companies. I was even internal auditors for some of them. I have trained internal auditors myself for my companies. Uh, I was trained for internal audit through my company, but it was not an official certificate. So it's mainly uh, something that we do internally, et cetera. And when I came out and went to consulting, um, so I, I am qualified from for me as an internal auditor or even an auditor for anything, but um, it arrived some moment where you have done some internal audits and then suddenly you got a call from your co customer and says, oh, do you have a certificate for internal audit because the notified body is asking for that, etc." I said, no. And even me, I'm really transparent from the beginning. I tell them I have no certificate. Uh, I have my experience. Here is my diploma. Here is my, uh, here is my, uh, my, my, my CV, etc." But some notified bodies or some auditors are not satisfied with that. I have myself trained people on is even the ISO 19011, which is the ISO for the audits. And inside, I read it 10 times again, and I <laughs> made the thing say, it's written if you have the experience and you can prove it, it's it's fine also. But yeah, we have some auditors that are not really satisfied with, uh, with this thing. So be careful of that. And we discussed also that with uh, Karen Deep. I said, maybe I should just uh, go to a training just to get this paper and uh, just to so sort out this because it starts to be annoying each time that you get a call where when you say, oh, do you have a certificate? Do you have a certificate? So, okay, let's make this certificate even if I don't need that. I will pay some thousand euros for that. But mainly this is, this is the idea. But um, I mean, do you find it? I mean, is there like a lack of understanding of all this for some auditors or... The thing is, there's nothing, there's no hard and fast rule in terms of what is acceptable. You know, if the standard said something like you must have a certificate with X amount of years experience, it will make everyone's life easier. Exactly, exactly. But they just use the word competent. What does competence mean and how do you measure it? Yeah. So now I think I think it's it's mainly that is is the point of yeah, what maybe people learned and how they understand. And yeah, the issue is always that that when it's fuzzy. Everybody can understand what they want uh, on this, but uh, I'm not blaming anyone. It's just that at certain point, uh, there is uh, also some um, common sense, if I can say, in terms of uh, what people are doing uh, so that uh, you can prove that they are great. I mean, even for EUMDR, I'm doing a lot of trainings on EUMDR. I'm, I trained a lot of people and people are asking me, prove me that you are an expert on EUMDR. I mean, <laughs> Uh, show me a certificate that you're. I mean, I mean, I am giving myself the certificates to people, so I've, I, I mean, it's it's sometimes the common sense should be also coming on, on this. Um, there was also something that was um that is important maybe to say to people. Um, I have also heard some auditors that were not satisfied by internal audits that 
were done by the companies uh, because the auditors were auditing their own work. So what is the rule there? Generally, so the person auditing should be impartial. So what does that mean? Quality and regulatory can't audit quality and regulatory because it's their own work. Uh, HR, human resources, can audit quality and regulatory. Quality and regulatory can audit HR. So often what companies do is they get their quality and regulatory person, they send them on the training. So they suit to be qualified. There's nothing wrong with their qualifications. They're very good at whatever it is they need to do the audit, but they're auditing their own work. That is the problem here, and auditors have an issue. So how do you get around that? The best way around it is either have somebody in the company, for example, somebody works in human resources or finance, you know, somebody that's got nothing to do with quality and regulatory, get them trained and have them audit that job section and get the quality and regulatory person to audit things like human resources and finance, i.e. job functions that they're not involved in. However, this can be a little bit difficult because you have, if you have somebody who doesn't work in a particular job function, they may not understand what that job function does or some of the terms and procedures that they work with. So often what companies do is they often hire external consultants in to come and do that internal audit for them. That's also acceptable. However, if you are going to do that in your internal audit procedure, you need to state that in some cases you may use external resources. Because if you use an external resource and your procedure says you can't do that, effectively that's a non-conformity because you're working against your procedure. Yeah, and uh, don't forget also that uh, the internal, uh, yeah, when you put that, um, on the procedure that you will use an external resource, um, train also this external resource to your procedure. Many, this is also the recording that I'm asking. Each time I'm doing an audit to somebody, I say, send me your procedure and send me the training records that I can share that I have been trained to that and I can, I know exactly how they are, are doing. And yeah, be consistent. All what is done by the external people should be managed through also this procedure. So because even if they are external, they should not just come and do what they want. They do uh, pair your procedure also. So it's many also important. And um, and yeah, you have some um, companies that are having this situation where they have audited their own work uh, and normally it becomes a non-conformance with a notified body or with a certification body. And then they ask you to redo the audit or to hire somebody else to do uh, to do the job. So mainly this is uh, something that is really important to understand that uh, yeah, having a team of auditors is can be also uh, great in the different areas. Um, but yeah, you have to make them to train them. Um, and just one thing, in terms of training, the, the methodology is all to send them to, as we said, uh, to uh, 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 a training. But training, I suppose, is not sufficient. Usually, we, we are asking to have a, like one or two or three audits um, with uh, a godfather, if I can say, with somebody that will be um, managing them before they can be doing audit by themselves. Is it correct? Or? Yeah, generally, that's also my experience as well. If somebody in a company wants to be an auditor, uh, either, either working with me or working within the company, what I often say, and I often do this with my clients as well when I'm doing an internal audit with them, I say, if there's anybody in the company that you want to be an auditor, just have them sit in on the audit as an observer. Learn the audit techniques, learn the questions. Once they've seen two to three audits, they immediately then begin to understand what are the typical questions you should be asking? What is the evidence that you should be asking for? Because audit technique cannot be taught. It's only something, in my view, that comes through experience. If you want to be a good auditor and you want to learn the techniques used, it's only something that you're going to either learn by going out and doing audits or watching an experienced auditor. Yeah, and uh, um, I think also, I have also had this case where um, auditors never had any work experience, if I can say. They never worked for a medical device company or they work, they, they had st the diplomas for biomedical engineering or whatever. And then they had, uh, they went directly to a training for being an auditor. And then they start to audit a company without really knowing how it's working inside the company. And this is also something that is a bit tricky to ask questions or to try to, understand uh, things that they never had experience with uh, because the, the problem with that is mainly that the, this this kind of auditor is just ticking boxes if i can say it's just saying this is good or this is bad without understanding the context without understanding the how this is working without understanding everything which can also be a problem for some companies because say these guys are coming they just tick boxes and they don't really understand our our, our work which is a bit of a problem also so Having also some experience working for a company, having a one-year cycle like the PRC that we are asking them to have a one-year cycle within a quality department, I think is is making you a great auditor. Just coming from school and directly auditing company, I, I will not really recommend that because then you will lose a lot of yeah the, the good things if I can solve the experience. Um, okay, so audit qualification is okay. Now, 
if I can say, before to perform an audit, it, I, I call it like, it's like performing on stage, if I can say, or performing like a sport competition. You will not just go to the Olympic Games without preparing for it months in advance, etc. Maybe, I mean, people are preparing maybe four years for the 30 second uh, competition that they will do. So it's many these kind of things. So here it's the same. I, I think you have to prepare the audit. So how would you advise people to prepare their audit? First and foremost, what you actually need to do with companies is that you need to, first of all, teach them what is an audit, just some basic understanding, you know, what is a quality management system? What is a technical file? So every one of the company has a basic understanding of what this stuff is, because the last thing you want is on an official audit that somebody turns up and they say, OK, what is an audit? What is this quality? You don't want to sit sitting in front of an auditor and the auditor say, please, can you show me a quality manual? Go, what is a quality manual? You exactly. don't want to be in that position. So have some top line training. And of course, the, just, the next just, thing you can do. Sure, just, go ahead. Yeah, just to 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 uh, to say maybe an anecdote on this on this kind of thing. So we have made that because, uh, for example, we, we have a, a rule. It mainly, it's mainly uh, in terms of the ISO 1345 is to understand what is a quality policy and that people should understand and know about it. So we had a, f a facility, a plant where we were uh, doing some. Um, mock inspections and we are asking people, do you know about the quality policy? And people say, no, I don't know about that. So we decided to make a training for them. So for all the people to explain to them what is a quality policy, where they can find it and they don't need to know it by heart, but to know where to find it, et cetera. So we made this training. At the end, after the training, we do an again a mock inspection and it was not still effective at all because people were not really understanding what we are talking about. At the end, we created some small badges where they have it on their belt and they can just, if they ask for a quality policy, they can just show it here is the quality policy it's on my belt etc even this sometimes was not efficient where we're asking them where is your quality policy they were not having it at all so i mean they, they, they have not the, their badge with them or whatever so they were missing that at the end what we made we 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 created a big uh, a big uh, uh wood if i can say plate where where we a sign where we wrote the quality policy written, and we hanged it at, at many places in the facility just to say if they ask you for quality policy you get just show it you can just show it here it is i mean for that but you see the effort that we are making just for people to understand and make uh, an understanding of the quality pol policy but it's mainly the same for everything else so what is this what is that so many this is also something that can be uh, can be tricky but yeah it's a big effort so it's not just something that can be done by just a small training on the classroom I agree with you. The last thing you want is an order to say, can you please show me a quality policy? And somebody says, what is that? Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's uh, no conformance immediately. I mean. So yeah, following on for that. So uh, mock audit, that's the next best thing you can do. So set up a audit in the company. Uh, and then you just go around and you question people. You say, you know, can you show me the quality policy? Can you show me the quality manual? And then you look at that person's training record and said, okay, you are doing job function X. Can you please show me how you work to procedure number six that correlates to that one? And then they'll watch that person work and then they'll see how they go through that procedure. That is the best way around it. And that will show you within the company who actually needs training. Number two, where the flaws are. And then, of course, number three, where the lack of understanding is. Now, the most important thing at audits is that there's nothing wrong with saying, you know, that is outside of my job function. Yeah. People need to be able to say that and say, OK, look. That's something that I don't do. Uh, the auditor may turn and say, okay, who would you speak to about this? You as an individual should have an understanding of whose job function that is. So if it's something quality and regulatory, you say, oh, I, I had a question like this. I will speak to the quality and regulatory manager. I will speak to the production director. So the whole purpose of this mock audit is preparing people for questions. You know, If an auditor asks a question to somebody who's not qualified to do something like that, the last thing you want that person to do is pretend that they understand it and start making mistakes because then the auditor said, okay, you've said that you'll be able to do this, but your training records don't reflect this non-conformity. So it's getting people ready for that sort of thing. Exactly. Now, the second one, of course, uh, as we were discussing earlier, the unannounced audit. Now, it's unannounced. You know, you can't prepare for it and not if our body's not going to pick up the phone and say, hey, next week we're going to do an unannounced audit on you. Get ready for it. It's literally just going to be, they may give you a phone call half an hour before they knock on your door saying, hey, you know, we want to do an unannounced audit. So how do you prepare for an unannounced audit? I'm surprised how many companies that I come across who don't have an unannounced audit procedure. And they say, oh, why do we need one? We'll just speak to our policy and regulatory person. Okay, fine. What if that person's on holiday? What if they're on the other side of the world? They're not going to jump on a plane and be back in your facility in, in half an hour. And again, it's getting people ready for an unannounced audit because for an unannounced audit, you generally have around 30 minutes. So they knock on your door and say, hey, you know, we want to do an unannounced audit on you. They usually give you 30 minutes of preparation time. So how do you deal with the unannounced audit? 
effectively, number one, you want to make sure that it's legitimate. How do you know it's not just a stranger who's pretending to be from a notified body and wants to get access to your facility? So, of course, you want to do the checks on them to make sure that they are who they say they are. Number two, of course, you want to make sure that they've got a room or some sort of place where they can sit down. They've got access to internet, they've got access to coffee, water, whatever that they basically need. And then, of course, number three is everybody in the company needs to know where the files are available. If the quality people aren't there or top management people are there, does everybody else in the company know where all the files and records are? Because if those people turn around and say, oh, the management is not here, the quality and regulatory people are not here, we can't do this audit, immediately you failed. That's not an excuse. So everybody in the company needs to know how to answer the door, how to conduct the checks on these people, and then, of course, number three, where to find the relevant records. That is very important here when it comes to market unannounced audits. Yeah, and uh, and I have also a story on this one. So uh, we had a discussion with one of my vice, pre vice president uh, when I was working for one corporate uh, company. So uh, and he asked me what makes you not sleep at night, if I can say those kind of sentences. And uh, I said, oh, actually, we are having a hard time because we are not ready for an unannounced audit and we will make the, the team ready for it, etc. And um, yeah, he listened to me and then he said, oh, thank you. So good work, etc. And uh, one or two weeks later, uh, we got a, a ring on the door and it was an, an announced audit. And uh, yeah, we were trying to prepare and we had made the training to people. So we are trying to prepare everything, etc. cetera. So uh, to make a thing ready. And we had a rule that uh, within 30 minutes, everything is ready. So the person is on the, uh, in, the, in the front room. We had a front room, back room system, and we can talk about that later, uh, et cetera. So, and after 30 minutes, I, I show up, if I can say, to the front room to greet the, uh, the auditor. And then I find out that it was my vice president of Quite Regulatory Affairs that was just here to test us if we were ready of honor not for an announced audit. And he continued. He asked me questions about like an announced auditor, uh, an announced auditor can ask and uh, we're uh, at the end ready for it. But it was just to show you that, yeah, we are also training our team for an announced audit in that, in that way. Hey, just a second. Do you need a EU, Swiss or UK representative? Then choose Easy Medical Device. We can represent you and also become your importer. Contact us at eo at easymedicaldevice.com. Agreed. And another point here is the management representative. A lot of companies have one management representative, which is great. What are you going to do when that management representative isn't there? Yeah. You know, what if that person is off sick? So generally, another way of preparing is have a second management representative. Now, if you're a company that's in the EU and has a CE mark, of course, you got the requirement for a PRRC, person responsible for regulatory compliance. But again, they always have to be readily available. So again, have a backup or even better backups. Now, if you are going to do this, you need to make sure that person's qualified so they meet the PRC requirements, i.e. a diploma with one year's experience and no diploma with four years experience. And likewise, with the second management representative, they need to be trained in the procedures and they need to know what they're doing. Of course, another point here as well. Now, if you have procedures in place and it says that job function X is doing job Y, always write in the procedures that this can be delegated to somebody else because if there is a particular job function, they're not available during the day of the audit, and the auditor wants to see how that particular procedure is conducted, allow for other people to do it. So it allows a bit more flexibility within the company. Exactly. Another important thing to do as well is before your official audit is have a management review in place. And why do I say this? A management review shows you looking at all of your records, your metrics, your quality objectives, manuals, changes, staffing, all of the requirements. It's basically a minuted record of your whole quality management system. The idea being is that if you do it before your audit, you can show this to an auditor and auditor can quickly see that your quality management system is working. They look at your metrics and all the different changes that have happened. And, now, and usually, usually they're asking that the first day, the first uh, the first morning, if I can say with the audit, they ask you directly this because they want to see a full overview of your company uh, before they can go on the different topics. So yeah, it's really important that. Agreed. Now, another important thing to mention here is if your management review procedure says we're only going to be doing it once annually. Yeah and you've done it within six months, you've actually gone against your procedure. So great, you've done it. You've done it earlier than usual. So if you, what my recommendation is in your management review procedures, you start at minimum, it'll be done once annually. Exactly. And then we'll do them more often as and when, because that, that's what you basically want to do, because sometimes there may be a kappa in the company, there might be a recall, and you may want to do your management reviews more often. Uh, number three, of course, with companies, sometimes top management are a little bit reluctant to talk about quality and what companies often do is they make their management reviews once quarterly. So the idea being they can get everybody together all in one room, 
and discuss the quality management system. It just sort of helps drill that. And especially in your early days, if a quality management system to you is new and you're only doing management reviews once a year, it's not really the best way of going about it because there's going to be so many changes and requirements going on. You're going to be wanting to do them very often, basically. Yeah. Another point, of course, is training records. Uh, make sure all of your training records are up to date because any time an auditor is going to be turning up and they're going to be seeing people working to procedures, you want to make sure that particular person is trained. Now, there's many different types of training. The most basic is a read and understand. Then you can have somebody shadowing a more experienced person. Uh, number three could be maybe external types of trainings as well. Now, a common mistake that I see with companies is when you review their training records, it will show that they're trained to all the procedures. Yeah. However, if it's somebody like an auditor, I say, okay, great. Where is your audit certificate that you mentioned that you have? Oh, it's on my personal drive at home. That's not wording I want to hear. <laughs> if your document control system says that everything will be retained in the QMS, you need to be putting your certificates in there. You need to be retaining them because your QMS is going to be holding them as per your requirements, whether that's five years, you keep documentation, 10 years, 15 years, et cetera. It needs to be on your system. So the last thing that an auditor wants to hear is, oh, it's on my personal drive at home. Because it's, then, it's not a controlled record at that point. It needs to be in your systems effectively. Exactly. Yeah. No, I think it's it's really important that uh, or having that on a drawer. So oh, I hide that on a drawer or I put that on a on a frame or whatever. These kind of things are. I mean, these are official documents, so you have to have them and show them to uh, to auditors also. Yeah. And then of course, the, another point here is conducting a supplier review on your notified and or approved body. How do you know that this approved body or notified body is up to the job? Have you checked them on the Nando database? Have you looked online to see that they're actually certified? Because they are a supplier of your services right now. And also, if you're going to be doing that, so you want to, first of all, obviously, of course, do a supply review on them. Number two, of course, is you want to add them to your approved supplier list. Because when an auditor is going to be turning up to your premises and they're going to be looking at your approved supplier list, they're often going to ask the question, well, why are we not on there? Why have you not conducted a review on us? How do you know that we're competent to do this job for you? And that can lead to a nonconformity. Again, a very minor point, but it's very important that you do this. And again, like the point we were mentioning earlier about if you're going to hire auditors externally, you also want to add them to an approved supply list because they're impacting your quality management system and your technical files. And of course, you want to make sure that these people are qualified to do the job that they're going to do for you. Exactly. And uh, mainly the, the the point here is also that uh, I got I got one of my customers that got a non-conformance uh, because of that, and they called us and said oh, how we can solve that. I said, yeah, you have to put them on our proof supplier list, and they, they put them as critical because for them it was critical. Uh, I said, okay, uh, if you want, but the problem is that when they we look at the procedure, it says for critical audits, uh, you have uh, for critical um, suppliers, you have to perform an audit, etc. For them, etc. I said, oh, I don't think you will go to audit the notified body <laughs> so it's maybe the point of uh, should i audit my notified body here i mean what we are doing is that um even if it's a critical if you think it's a critical i don't think it's a critical it's maybe a key um a key supplier but critical i'm, I'm not sure um the 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 thing is uh, mainly that you can uh, write down on your procedures that as soon as it's an accredited body somebody that got an accreditation from an health authority there is no need of audit and then you just um, take the accreditation that they received, or you can make a copy of uh, of what you have on the Nando database, for example, for, for notified bodies. Uh, they, there is the information of their accreditation inside, and then you can pick it and put it on your system to say, yes, I, I verified them. They are accredited for MDR, for example, or they are certified, for, they are accredited for ISO 13485, and then you can put them on your, on your list to say, as soon as it's an accredited laboratory or notified body or whoever, there is no need for me to audit them, even if they, they are critical for you, because then you go contract you contradict if I, contradict if I can say your procedure to say it is a critical supplier the critical supplier I should audit them but this one I will not audit it why and this is many the reason why you have to write that down on your uh, also on your uh, procedure yeah yeah definitely so I mean this particular one is interesting for AMD company software as a medical device if they're using things like Amazon AWS Git Microsoft yeah. Google. Google's not going to invite you down to California and say, hey, you are audit our premises. It's not going to happen. So what you can do in that case is you conduct a supplier review. And how do you do that? You go through the terms and conditions, the service level agreements. You look at downtime, uptime, backup periods, uh, complaints, that sort of thing. So you work with what you have effectively. 
exactly i mean it's it's true that they are these are the difficult part where you have big players and you are just a small fish if i can say on this and they will not open the door for you or whatever i mean at the end they will say yeah if you don't want to use our products it's fine go somewhere else because you are really a small fish so you have really to um find your ways um um out of all that and not just say oh i cannot so i will not do it no you have to still maintain uh compliance to your procedures so yeah as you said currently maybe uh, going to all the documents that are available um on the terms and conditions etc is maybe a desktop audit as we call it but maybe this is sufficient to verify that they are having a policy for anything that you need for for your service there um can we talk maybe quickly about front room back room what is that yes so front room back room is effectively in the audit you have the front room so that could be your quality rep your management representative alongside top management sitting with the auditor and the auditor sitting across the desk for them or if it's been conducted remotely and that person is basically sitting there actively so the auditor may say can you show me this particular procedure can you show me records the back room is the people that you don't see in that front room those are people that you're communicating them via chat channels or when you're walking around your premises and they are the people that are effectively fetching the documentation for you or getting hold of records while you sit with the auditor and that is the general approach because if you just have one guy doing everything and the auditor can you show me this particular procedure they disappear for 10 to 15 minutes and then come back it's not the most efficient way of doing things and again number two the auditor is going to get suspicious that maybe this person is hiding something that they keep disappearing every few minutes so the best approach is have people that are going to be front facing to the auditor and then have people in the background that you could be messaging saying okay the auditor is now going to be talking about supply review in the next five minutes can you please get the latest procedure and any records associated with that the idea being is when the auditor asks the question you have that readily available that generally i find is the best approach that you can have within companies and it's it's a good approach also to be efficient uh, because sometimes the problem is that yeah if as you said if you go out in etc you are maybe losing some time and you are not progressing too quick on the audit um, if you are sitting in front of the auditor and flipping your folders or flipping the documents to try to find it it's the same you are here and they are just waiting and say okay when are you getting this when are you getting that and you also start to be nervous etc so having a team that is doing the um, the work to find the document, to verify, to check, etc., is really important. Um, the problem sometimes is the disconnection between the front room and back room. So what we have put in place, for example, in my in some of the version that we had, so we have the chat, as you've said, that we are having with the people. So we are making a specific chat channel where we are discussing this and that. And we have a scribe also that is on the front room. It's just an observer. It has nothing to do with the our group, etc., is just there and is writing. He's saying the auditor is doing this, the auditor is asking that, the auditor is talking about this, etc., etc. And in the back room, we have a screen where the scribe information are there. So it's just for the back room to see the feeling of what's happening inside the front room. Is the auditor happy? Is the auditor angry? Are they chit chatting about chocolate or whatever? Are they what are they doing? So they just to have this feeling. And sometimes the funny thing is that you know when you arrive to nearly the end of the audit. Uh, you see to have a lot of people that are starting to come to back room to see what's happening and if everything is fine. And they are watching the scribe notes like a football match <laughs> to see if, <laughs> what, he, what he will say. He will say it's okay or it's not okay. So it's really funny when you see that at the end, but it's really a great moment also because it's why I, I'm remembering that. And at the end, we had also the auditors that says, oh, you have a back room. Can we see the back room? So then they went to the back room and they saw the back room, et cetera. And it was really a great moment also. So having that is not hiding information. It's just to make it more easy for the auditors to receive quickly their data and also for you to show them exactly what they were asking because sometimes i mean, we had a lot of time those those experiences where we show them something and said no it's not what i asked you I said, oh really oh sorry for that and then this is the issue so the objective is to sort out to find exactly the information they were asking and to define also sometimes the strategy on how you would explain that to them who should go to the front room to explain that to the auditor, et cetera, et cetera. And this is better to do that in the back instead of just trying to manage that in front with, uh, with the auditor directly. Yeah, I completely agree with that. But again, uh, train people on the front room, back room. The last thing you want to do is on the day you set up a back room exactly. and then nobody can access it. Yeah, and uh, we have uh, we have uh, yeah we had some training also. So usually when we do uh, we know there is there is an audit. So the day before we do the mock training, if I can say of the front room back room, we check that the printers are connected for printing. We check that everybody has those uh, Wi-Fi codes. If there is an audit for Wi-Fi code, I mean we check all those technical things that can happen. If for example the day of the audit, technical things are not happening. So what should we do then? <laughs> 
have backups in place. I've seen this time and time again with companies, especially remote working companies. And I say, okay, what system are you using? Oh, we're using SharePoint. We're using G Drive. Okay, great. What are you going to do when these services go down? Silence. So always have a backup system in place, either that's internal servers or maybe another file sharing service. Because if you're sitting in front of an auditor, and oh, sorry, our file sharing service is down. The auditor is not going to sit there and go, okay, I'll come back in two days' time. It doesn't work like that. That's where the issues are going to be. So always have a backup for your backup. Now, the argument people have is say, oh, our file sharing system has a backup service. But have you tested that? No, it's automatically backed up every 24 hours. But have you gone back seven days, 20 days, et cetera, to see if you can retrieve those files? Of course, test that. Uh, another way of doing it is really the day before the audit, maybe you just want to have like an offline download, maybe on your internal servers or maybe on a USB stick or a laptop or something like that. And there's nothing wrong with saying to the auditors, hey, look, I downloaded these files last night. Our server is now down, but these are the latest ones that they have. The auditor will completely understand that. So that's something that you can do as well. And and if you have that also on the procedure, it's great because then you are having this backup system in place and you have defined this policy of before an audit, you do this download thing, etc. I mean, write that down and the auditor will be more happy because, yeah, you executed exactly the what you have defined on your uh, on your procedure, which is uh, mainly, mainly what they were they are expecting uh, expecting also. Um, Okay, so is there anything else to say about preparation for audit? Again, the backups like we talked about, if you're going to have a backup PRC and a backup management representative, name that person either in your roles and responsibilities or organization chart. Well, the best thing that you can do, have a letter of appointment from top management, a director, CEO, et cetera, saying that this particular person will be the backup for a PRC or a management representative. And again, you can have multiple, you can have multiple backup PRCs, you can have multiple backup management representatives, as long as they're trained and qualified. But if you have a letter of appointment, it's something that you have on a hard file that you can just show to the auditor and say, hey, this is a backup person today, the management representative was not available, but this is our next appointed person, and they're ready to do the job. Because as part of the standards and regulations, you're required to basically assign roles and responsibilities through a letter of appointment, it's the best way of doing it. Yeah, exactly. And also, um, sometimes for PRC specifically, they will maybe ask you for your experience, for diplomas, etc. Uh, have them also ready within your HR department. Have them available and recorded already. Because, yeah, it's not the, during the audit that you will say, oh, yeah, it's on, on my mother's home attic or whatever that uh, it's there. So I have to go back and take it, etc., etc., which is uh, not, not really professional. So have also those information already available and anticipate questions from the auditor so that you can already say, oh, if you ask me this question, what should I do? Okay, let's prepare this answer, et cetera, et cetera. So this is mainly the thing that you have also to do during an audit uh, or preparation of an audit to prepare what kind of question you can ask and to then be ready to answer to that with proofs, evidence, et cetera. Um, okay, Karan I think we covered everything. I hope it's really helpful. Uh, we have made also a lot of episodes uh, previously on um, uh, audits, internal audits, um, uh, normal audits, etc. We have even talked about audit with uh, Martin Vitter from TubeSud also from the auditor notified body side. So don't hesitate. I will try to put everything on the show notes, but yeah, uh, maybe I will miss some. But don't hesitate to go on the YouTube channel also and to uh, then uh, look at uh, at, uh, at those kind of episodes. Okay, Karan Deep, so... Um, in terms of uh, your services, so what can you help your uh, audience do? So how why you our audience should contact you? Yeah, so if people just want to learn more about quality regulatory affairs or generally what's happening in the medtech industry, the best way of doing that is if you follow me on LinkedIn. Uh, you can also follow me on YouTube as well. Right? I often host a lot of my videos as well. And you can also follow my podcast, the MedTech Podcast, which is available on all major platforms, Spotify, Google, Apple, etc. And again, if anybody has any questions regarding to audits or quality and regulatory, the best way to often reach me is via LinkedIn or via my email, which you can provide in the show notes. Great. And one last thing. So uh, we are also both uh, MedTech uh, leading voices also uh, with the MLV uh, group. So mainly we are trying also to select some great content also to share with you uh, in, a, in a newsletter. So don't hesitate also to go to the hashtag MLV. Uh, and also to follow the, the newsletter so that uh, you can get also all the updates in terms of quality and regulatory affairs for medical devices. And it's a great initiative that was done. Uh, so uh, that uh, that I, I suppose will be uh, providing you also great content. So don't hesitate also to, to do that. Okay, Karandip, so 
thank you for um, this um, all the information that you provided. And uh, yeah, I I hope yeah this will be helpful. And don't hesitate for the people that are listening to also ask questions. If you have any questions, you can also tag us on um, LinkedIn. Uh, so if you have any points uh, here or comments also of this episode, don't hesitate also to go and to uh, to inform us if you have any question. Okay, Karandeep. So thank you very much, and I wish you a nice day. Thank you very much for the